Hello, everyone. My name is Kevin Lentz, and I'm the Analytics Marketing Manager at Unchained Labs. I'll be your moderator today, so I want to thank you for joining and welcome to our webinar. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So to ask questions, all you have to do is click on the Q&A in the Zoom navigation bar at the top or bottom of your screen and type in your question. Uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can. And now I'd like to introduce Keith Salomon, uh, who is field application scientist for our analytical portfolio uh, at Unchained Labs. Today, Keith will take us through the ins and outs of industry standard setups for dynamic light scattering or DLS and why other approaches for DLS may not be right for your protein or viral size analysis. And now I'll hand it over to Keith. Thank you very much, Kevin. Really appreciate the introduction. Um, as Kevin said, I am the FAS at Unchained Labs. Uh, my territory is New England and the upper Midwest. So if winter to you is long johns and snow blowers, I'm the scientist you're most likely to be dealing with at Unchained Labs. So today we're going to talk about deconstructing DLS, how scattered light becomes size data for your biologics. And uh, another uh, subtitle for this is DLS Truth and Consequences. And we'll go through how DLS works and how some choices that you can make in designing a DLS system might affect your acquisition of quality data. <clears throat> so DLS conceptually is a pretty simple idea. Um, basically, it, it revolves around the idea that uh, big things move slowly and small things move quickly. And pictured here, you can see a, a tropical goldfish, which is going to move very quickly. And on the right hand side, you see a manatee that is going to move rather slowly. And if you take away elements of self propulsion, like you would if for a biologic, you're really talking about diffusion and Brownian motion. And fortunately, the principle still applies. Big things move slowly, small things move quickly. And that's really all DLS is capturing. And it, it's conceptually, it's a simple thing. In life sciences, we care a lot about subvisible particles. We care about uh, lipid nanoparticles, we care about virus-like particles, we certainly care about viruses, and critical biological molecules like nucleic acids and proteins. And you can't see these things, obviously, with your eyes or a conventional microscope. You can buy an electron microscope and spend millions of dollars and reinforce the floors of your institute, but there's an easier way to look at these things, so to speak, and that's using dynamic light scattering. So dynamic light scattering is, it allows us uh, to essentially visualize the size of these particles and to understand their behaviors in solution. And that's really important if you're a life scientist and you're creating biologics or uh, gene therapies. At Unchained Labs, we, we cover DLS really uh, completely. We have on the left pictured our stutter instrument which is the only UV vis instrument that has DLS capabilities. It's a fantastic high throughput, low sample volume instrument that uses uh, 96 well plates that are SBS compliant. It's completely amenable to automation. And if you want to do B22 KD analysis or dig deep into your AEV titers or your um, empty full ratios, the stunner is a fabulous instrument. It's really one of a kind. But we're not going to talk about the stunner today. We're really going to talk about the uncle on the right hand side. And the uncle is a fabulous biophysical tool. There is really nothing like it. It has full spectrum fluorescence. It does static light scatter, dynamic light scatter. It has a Peltier element for thermal control. It has reasonably low sample volumes, 8.8 .8 microliters and 30 micrograms per ml solutions work fantastically well on the uncle. And you can run 48 samples at a time. So it's a fairly high throughput instrument that gives you fabulous biophysical data. And it's unique in the field in that it contemporaneously is looking at uh, your melting points is whether your onsets of aggregation on the same sample at the same time. The uncle has a 266 nanometer laser, which we use to excite intrinsic fluorescence. It also has, and we use for small particle static light scatter, 
It has a 473 nanometer laser, which we use for large particle static light scatter, as well as to excite extrinsic uh, dyes, such as cyber orange or cyber gold, as well as maybe a fluorochrome or a, a, um, a drug conjugated to an antibody that is excitable by the blue 473 laser. It has a 660 nanometer laser, which we use for DLS. It has a CCD. It has an avalanche photodiode and it has a Peltier element for doing thermal ramps. And when you add all of that together in one instrument, you have a powerful biophysical tool that produces a, a number of data streams that are very informative about the biophysical properties of your analytes. And these could be proteins, viruses, polymers. And you can pretty much complete a CQA of a biologic using the uncle and a couple of orthogonal tools. So it's a very powerful instrument. And as I said before, it's unique in that it contemporaneously is going to be able to give you the, um, the melting point as well as the onsets of aggregation on the same sample in real time, which is really important for understanding the complexity of your biologics. One of the things that makes the uh, uncle such a powerful instrument is the design of a proprietary sample holder, which is called the UNI. And it's an array of 16 optical grade quartz cuvettes in an anodized metal frame. Each one of these quartz cuvettes takes exactly 8.8 .8 microliters and it's open on the top and the bottom. So any gas that might be there evolves to the surface and disappears. Once the UNIs are filled, they're sealed between silicon gaskets, allowing you to do long-term stress analyses up to three months of, uh, with stable samples sealed between those silicon gaskets. And this um, uni is placed right on top of the Peltier element, allow for really efficient heat transfer when you're doing a thermal ramp. You don't need a thermal couple in each of the cuvettes to know what the temperature is because the efficient heat transfer, it is the temperature of the Peltier element. So it's beautifully designed instrument and a beautifully designed proprietary sample holder. The way uh, the uncle uh, measures um, thermal stability is by looking at changes in intrinsic fluorescence as a function of temperature. What we're looking at here is that the change in position of the hydrophobic aromatic fluorescent residues as the protein melts. So as the protein loses secondary structure, those hydrophobic aromatic moieties uh, become solvent exposed. And that produces a change in their fluorescence emission. What happens is, is there a diminution of signal and a change to longer, lower energy wavelength emissions. What we refer to is typically as a redshift. So when a protein melts, you see both a diminution of signal and a rightward shift of the wavelength emissions. Simultaneously with that, we're capturing static light scatter at two separate wavelengths, at 266 nanometers and at 473 nanometers, allowing you to see the change in aggregation profile also as a function of temperature at the same time that you're looking at changes in intrinsic fluorescence to determine the melting points. In addition to that, using the 473 laser and the full spectrum fluorescence capabilities of the instrument, we're able to look at changes in extrinsic dyes like cyber orange or cyber gold, or for instance, a fluorochrome or a drug that fluoresces that may be conjugated to a protein like in a antibody drug conjugate. So it's a really powerful method for capturing a lot of information at the same time. And all of this can be done with a, a, you know, a very finely tuned thermal ramp because of course the instrument has a Peltier element. It's important to be able to capture both the aggregation behavior and the, the colloidal stability essentially and the thermodynamic stability of the analyte at the same time. And let me explain why. And this, I think, uh, experiment here illustrates the power of this technology quite nicely. So here is an antibody heated from 25 to 95 degrees using a 0.3 degree per minute ramp rate. 
And in blue, we've uh, plotted the thermogram developed from the changes of the spectral emissions analyzed by barycentric mean analysis. And we've indicated two transition points where we see it, and we've marked them as TM1 and TM2. In green, you can see the uh, SLS um, static light scatter from using the 266 nanometer laser. And you can see that we've marked where the particle formation begins, the onset, the TAG of, of aggregation uh, with an arrow in green. Okay, so if you look at the transitions in the blue line, you can see that TM1, the first melting point that we've indicated, um, happens without an aggregation event. So you can be pretty certain that the changes in intrinsic fluorescence that you're looking at here are due to changes in secondary structure or the melting of the protein. But that second TM, TM2, occurs contemporaneous with an aggregation event. So interpreting that second transition is a little more complicated because it, not, it may not just involve changes in secondary structure, but it may cha involve changes in aggregate behavior. And if you're not capturing all of this at the same time on the same samples, you really are not capturing the thermodynamic uh, and colloidal stability of your analyte completely. And you can't really even interpret the data completely. And UNCLE is unique in the field in that it gives you this data on the same samples at the same time. UNCLE also does really nice dynamic light scattering as well. Uh, it's certainly fully functional. Uh, dynamic light scattering works beautifully. On the left-hand side, you can see a, a, a single measurement of DLS where we're looking at a, a protein antibody. Uh, you can see that it has the, the uh, what you'd expect of a hydrodynamic diameter of an antibody around 10 nanometers. And we see a, a slightly larger peak um, of some aggregates that have formed. Maybe this antibody has been kept in at four degrees for a little too long. On the right side, you can see that we can also do DLS as a function of temperature. So here is two different formulations of a protein. And as you can see, we're able to capture the change in hydrodynamic diameter as a function of temperature and a function of formulation using the UNCLE instrument. So it, it really does full functioning DLS, both single measurements and as a function of temperature and formulation as well. On the UNCLE instrument, you can get fabulous DLS data in seconds. On the left-hand side, we're looking at a, a, mono, a fairly monodispersed protein with a very small polydispersity or standard deviation in its diameter. And we've shown you indicated the Z average. And the Z average is the average of the hydrodynamic diameters of all the populations that are there. And this is a monodispersed population. In the middle, we see something that has some polydispersity. Um, the, we cannot resolve these species into two separate peaks, but nevertheless, you can see the standard deviation has increased dramatically. And that you can see that the Z average is, hasn't changed, but nevertheless, there are two, uh, two or more populations present here, but we can't resolve them. And on the right-hand side, you can see a Z average that's a larger, a larger hydrodynamic average uh, average hydrodynamic diameter. And you can see two unique populations, something that's slightly north of 10 nanometers and something that's uh, significantly larger, maybe 300 nanometer particles. And again, the Z average is a combination of the hydrodynamic diameters of both those populations. And on the onco, you can capture this data in seconds. You can also, as we said, do uh, DLS as a function of temperature. Here we can see that this analyte is changing size as a function of temperature very nicely. So from 40 to about 70 degrees, the protein remains uh, its normal hydrodynamic diameter of approximately 10 nanometers. As the protein is heated up, it starts aggregating and we can see that very nicely. Here we can see that uh, at, a, at a point just uh, outside of 70 degrees, it's increased in size to somewhere around 90 nanometers. 
Uh, then it becomes a hundred nanometer and larger particle. And then at the end of the thermal ramp, it reaches the limit of our de detection ability. It becomes a particle that's in excess of a micron. So you can capture all of these size changes on the UNCLE instrument using the DLS capabilities and the Peltier element. Again, wonderful technology. So how does DLS work? It's actually pretty simple. So you have a solution with some particulate analyte in there. It could be a protein, could be a polymer, could be a virus, and you're trying to laser through it. Uh, and light scatters. As those particles move, the constructive and destructive interference of the light waves change. That produces intensity fluctuations. And you have more intensity fluctuations that happen more rapidly with small particles than you do with large particles. So then those intensity fluctuations are take, uh, converted by an autocorrelator into a correlation function, which is really a decay function with the y-intercept indicating basically identity of position because in a very short time frame, those molecules, those biologics in solution have it moved. But as those biologics begin to move, you lose that identity and you produce a decay function which is illustrated on the left hand, lower left-hand side of the slide. And based on the size, a bigger thing will decay its initial position more slowly than a smaller thing. And that's indicated by the blue plot, which represents a larger uh, biologic than the green plot, which represents a smaller biologic. We take those intensity fluctuations, we produce a correlation function, we do a cumulance analysis of that correlation function to derive the diffusion coefficients of the analytes. We take that diffusion coefficient, plug it into the Stokes-Einstein equation, calculate your hydrodynamic diameters. Then based on the, the um, standard deviation of those hydrodynamic diameters, we can calculate your polydispersity and that's essentially what DLS is going to give you. And that's how we do it. Our instruments meet ISO standards. You can expect the highest quality DLS data from both our stunner as well as our uncle instruments. So rest assured, our instruments meet all ISO standards and they're high quality DLS instruments. DLS is a great technique for looking co at colloidal stability. So on the left-hand side, you can see a, a protein that's uh, antibody size. Um, it has no apparent aggregates. It's around uh, 12, 13 nanometers in size. So after a stress test or some other manipulation, you can see that colloids are present. So here you see the, the peak. Um, the first, the main peak is broadened indicating that there are probably multiple species there. And then there's a second peak, a well-resolved second peak around 100 nanometers, indicating the presence of very light, large colloids and giving you an understanding of the colloidal stability of this analyte. Really, the correlation function of DLS is really says it all, it really does. Uh, and if you can interpret correlation functions well, you can actually get most of the information that you need. In the gray curve, we can see that there's a, uh, a moderately sized particle, a small particle, uh, and it has one slope. So this is a monodispersed species of relatively small size. Uh, the green line represents, um, well, you can really tease out that there are two slopes there. And so this is going to be the average of two particles. And on average, it, it's a modestly sized. So you're going to expect to see a larger particle and a smaller particle. And together, they form, uh, give a correlation function indicating, on average, a modestly sized particle. And then there's a large size particle. And here you can see it has, again, one slope. And here you can see that the decay function uh, is the decay begins much later. It maintains essentially identity for a much longer period of time, indicating that it, it is a large particle. And on the right side, 
we can picture that more easily where we have a large blue particle, a smaller gray particle, and then two particles representing the green line, one of uh, large size and one of small size, which produces the intermittent uh, least, um, shape, uh, size correlation function and the, a Z average, which would be a combination of both of those peaks. So a correlation function really gives you all the information that you need uh, in order to understand the complexity and the sizing of your analytes. So how do we do it at Unchained Labs? Well, we have a 660 nanometer laser and we have our avalanche photodiode at 90 degree angle from that 660 laser. And that makes a lot of sense. We don't have to worry about um, separating the incident light from the scattered light because we have a right angle detected. And we use an avalanche photodiode because it's a wonderful way of capturing uh, uh, spectral uh, data or photons. And avalanche photodiodes are used in the industry because they have fantastic integration speeds and wonderful photo efficiency, somewhere around 70% and in some instances even uh, higher than that. They're very sensitive and uh, they can be configured such that they're really sensitive for uh, red uh, lasers. In our case, our uh, avalanche photodiode works perfectly well for a, a 660 nanometer laser. So you want an avalanche photodiode or an APD uh, as your detector when you're designing a DLS system. Okay, DLS choices and consequences. So in the next couple of slides, we're gonna look at some of the, uh, this graphic image here, which is a representation of the, um, the particle uh, um, of the, how important particle size is with the scatter of the light, as well as how important it is to have detectors at different angles for measuring that scattered light. So um, the, the directionality and the, the size of the light scatter that you see is based on the size of those concentric circles that are pictured here. And in purple, we have a, what is represented the light scatter from a 405 nanometer laser, and in red, the light scatter from a 660 nanometer laser, which is how our instruments are configured. And there are gonna be some real important differences in how these lasers react to different size particles and how the angular dependence of the detector is really important for detecting the light scatter from those different particle sizes. Okay, so let's look at this. When you're looking at a 10 nanometer particle, let's say an antibody, whether you have a 405 or a 660 nanometer laser, you're gonna get very nice isotropic scatter. This is what we refer to as Rayleigh scatter. And it's how uh, lay, um, light is scattered by very small particles. And you can see that whether you have a detector at 130 degrees or 90 degrees as we do, you're gonna be able to capture the intensity of that light scatter very nicely. But that begins to change as the particle size changes. So when you get to a 100 nanometer particle, you can see that when you have a 405 nanometer laser, you have an awful lot of forward scatter. It's also true with a 660 la nanometer laser, but not nearly as much. And again, if you have uh, your detector at 90 degrees and you're using a 660 nanometer laser, you're getting plenty of that scattered light. If you have a 130 degree detector, you're not getting quite as much. But if you have a 405 nanometer laser, well, you're not getting nearly as much as you would if you have a 660 nanometer laser. So there are some real important consequences when you're looking at a 100 nanometer particle because you're not getting all that signal that you would from a 660 nanometer laser. Now, when you get to a 250 nanometer particle, and again, that's well within the range of large viruses and other things that biolog biologists really care about, 405 nanometer laser, what?
when you have a 405 nanometer laser, what's happening here is that what what's happening here is that almost all of your light scatter is in the forward direction. And if you had a detector at 130 degrees, very little of that light is coming to that detector. If you have a, a 660 nanometer laser and a 90 degree detector, there's still plenty of light, scattered light, getting to your detector, allowing for you to do the DLS the way you need to, to capture that information about the particle size and its polydispersity for, for the analysis that you need. Another way to picture this, excuse me, is to look at this on a, both a linear and a log scale. The linear scale is what we presented before. On the right side, you can see this on a log scale. And again, it illustrates the point very, very nicely. If you have a 250 nanometer particle, again, well within the range of things that biologists care about, you're really losing a lot by using a 405 nanometer laser. You're not getting much at your 130 degree angle detector at all. If you had a 90 degree angle detector, you might get a little, but when you have a 660 nanometer laser, you're still getting very nice light scatter in all directions, and, we, and a 90 degree detector is perfectly suited to capture that information. So there are real consequences of using a 405 nanometer laser with regards to your ability to detect the things that are really important. In my mind, using a 600 plus nanometer laser is the way to go when you're designing a DLS system. But that's not just my opinion. That's the opinion of a lot of other people as well. Look, at Unchained Labs, we use 660 nanometer lasers in our instruments. But other people use, you know, lasers north of, of 600 nanometers as well. There are tens of thousands of DLS instruments, all with lasers that are greater than 600 nanometers. There's a good reason for that. They work really well for doing DLS. And using other kind of lasers, in many regards, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There are other aspects of using other lasers. So if you, here is a collagen solution, and you can see that the 650 nanometer laser penetrates deeply in that collagen solution, much more deeply than a 532 nanometer laser or a 405 nanometer laser, indicating that a lot of this light is being absorbed. In addition to that, specifically when you're talking about biologics, there are lots of things that are conjugated to antibodies and other proteins that absorb in the 400, in the uh, nanometer, 450 nanometer range, anything that will absorb blue light. And many of those things fluoresce as well. And an APD is just a photon counter. So if you're having a, um, scattered light and fluorescent light, it will count all of those photons. And there may be solutions to this pro these problems, but it adds a level of complexity that seems to be unnecessary. And it seems to me, unless you're like Ma Russ Madag putting together a DLS system in his barn in Kansas, it seems that you would want to use a 600 plus nanometer laser to get quality DLS. It also matters the size of the sample holder. So in our uni, we have a 1.84 millimeter inner diameter. And this is important because the laser is going through a solution and light is being scattered from the particles in there. And so the more particles it interacts with, the more light is scattered and the better your D quality DLS data that you have. If you change those diameters to something a lot smaller, well, it, the light is going to interact with a lot less particles passing through that solution. So you probably have to increase the concentration of your analyte to get the same quality DLS data. So the dimensions of your sample holder matter. So your laser matters, the angle of your detector matters, the dimensions of your sample holder matter. You don't want to sacrifice these things you want optimal. 
configurations so that you can get the best quality DLS data available. Let's look at uh, some, maybe some of these consequences by uh, looking at the NIST monoclonal antibody that's been made available to a lot of biophysical scientists in order to understand how their techniques work in comparison. The NIST monoclonal antibody is pegged at around uh, 9.96 nanometers. That's what its size is expected to be in the NIST antibody publication. When you measure this protein on our in uncle instrument, we get approximately that size with a, uh, a reasonable 95 confidence level. And of course, you have to expect with a biologic, there may be some variation there on its strength of the buffer. Even if it's done in water, the pH of water can vary. So this sort of variation is not unexpected. Other QVET-based systems give you similar, maybe slightly higher uh, um, hydrodynamic diameters for your um, NIST antibody but certainly reasonable. When you're talking about a capillary-based system, well, you're talking about one instance where you have uh, 95 confidence levels that are quite larger, so you're less certain of the size of that uh, antibody. And if you use a different configuration where you're using single capillaries, you're way outside of what the expected size should be. And maybe this is a product of the the configuration of the instrument or the, the size of the sample holder, can't be sure why it's that way, but clearly you would prefer to have data that is uh, more representative of what it should be than things that you have some doubt about. And you don't want doubt when you're doing this kind of work because ultimately you may, mo most of you are making uh, drugs and other things for human consumption. And you don't want doubt, you want more certainty. So you should demand the best DLS systems that are available. Our system, you know, for an antibody, um, 50 micrograms per ml gives you extraordinarily high quality data. You can certainly get really quite good quality data at even lower concentrations. And for a small protein, 100 micrograms per ml is great, but you can get lower than that and still get ex outstanding quality data. Um, you should be able to detect sizes up from 0.3 nanometers, caffeine, to all the way up to a micron, and you should expect to uh, understand these things with a great deal of accuracy and precision. Uh, these are important measures that are required. Um, you should expect size accuracy that are plus or minus 2%. If your system is not giving you that sort of data, it's not really as high quality a system as you can have. You shouldn't have interference from bio biomolecules. I mean, 660 nanometer lasers are not gonna be absorbed by things that biologists are using. That's why one of the reasons we use it, it produces beautiful light scatter, but doesn't get absorbed by the bio molecules of interest. And it certainly isn't gonna cause fluorescence, which will complicate your DLS analysis. And you should be able to have your system 21 CFR part 11 compliant so that your system can be put in a GMP GLP lab. If it can't be made 21 CFR part 11 compliant, you have to ask yourself, why is that? What is up with this system that it's not ready to be put into a GMP GLP lab? Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you all uh, being here today. I hope I explained the basics of DLS and gave you some reasons to think about the configuration of systems and maybe the sacrifices that you'll make by one configuration and the benefits that our platform, our uncle platform has for your investigations. So now I'll take some questions. Thank you very much for your time. All right, thanks a lot, Keith. That was a lot of really excellent detail. Uh, and I think, you know, just going back through the points, it seemed like we covered a lot starting from you know, the instruments that Unchained Labs has that can do dynamic light scattering, uh, kind of touching also on the, the ways that UNCLE can help you with conformational colloidal stability. Uh, we started from the basics of Brownian motion and getting all the way through the optical setups and data analysis that are done with DLS. And then took a closer look at the engineering choices around laser wavelength, consumables, and angles that are used during DLS, what impacts those might have on the ability to read data uh, including one little uh, 
real world example there at the end using this map as a common size standard. Uh, so with that in mind, we have some Q&A that have come in. And so I will uh, start asking you that from that list. So first one is why when particle size gets large, is there so much front scatter? Well, um, the first thing I got to say is that you have to think of um, uh, scattered light as electromagnetic radiation in order to understand why that is. And um, the second thing I, I'd like to say is that, you know, like the speed of light it's, and, the, and gravity, it's, it's really just the way the physical universe is behaving. Um, and this particular uh, product, um, property of light um, is basically solutions of Maxwell's equations that um, were really promulgated by Gustav Mee um, in the 1850s. And it's amazing to me that they were able to come up with these complex understandings of the behavior of light without necessarily having the tools to measure all of these things. But these predictions of how light scatters are actually fundamentally true. And you can find this in, in your own system where uh, you will be able to see uh, differences in the scattered light depending on the uh, size of the particle where you might, ex where it exactly fits with the me theory, which explains light scatter and why it's scattering in a forward direction. I know I've definitely been on at least one deep Wikipedia dive, uh, starting from Gustav Me. So yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, and if anybody out there would like some references where you could read more about Gustav Me's solutions to Maxwell's equations, I'd be happy to send them over to you. Right. Okay, so we have a, a, another question here. So what is closer? Well, the, the way the question's phrased is, what is closer to reality, intensity or mass distribution? And I might, might think about that question too of uh, how might you use intensity distribution versus when would you use mass distribution? Well, I mean, they both are representations of reality. Um, they're different kinds of representations. And it's because that light scatter scales by the power of six in so versus size. So if something is 10 times larger, it scatters a million times more light. And the way I like to use mass and intensity distributions is thusly. Intensity distributions are really good for looking at colloids that don't represent a huge fraction of the material that you have there, but nevertheless scatter a lot of light. And these large colloids may be the most biologically relevant colloids that might be formed due, during a stress analysis of your biologic because they may produce those severe adverse reactions that you want to, immunologic reactions that you want to avoid. I like to look at mass distributions. They're really good for looking at decay of monomer by fragmentation because small things are much better represented in that mass distribution. So loss of monomer happens two different ways. There's fragmentation and there's aggregation. And by looking at both the intensity and mass distributions, you can appreciate both of those things. And that's why we present both of those types of data uh, to our clients when they're looking, doing an UNCLE analysis. Yeah, I know I definitely talk about uh, the intensity distribution as a way, as one of the best ways to identify rare, large colloids, like you said. Yeah. Right, so I like to think of it as the dinosaur in a room full of mice. <laughs> That's one way to think about it. Uh, okay, let's go back to the questions list. Um, so we have one from uh, kind of a definition question from early on. Uh, so what is PDI and how would you define a monodispersed population? Well, it's polydispersity and it's really, it's a very, it's a mathematical model, model to explain the complexity of a sample. So it's the, um, it's really the standard deviation of the Z average divided by the Z average squared. And we follow um, ISO standards with the definition of what's monodispersed, moderately uh, polydispersed, and polydispersed. So anything that is, uh, has a PDI of uh, less than 0.1 is considered monodispersed. Between 0.1 and 0.2 is modestly polydispersed. And anything above 0.2 is polydispersed. Um, and that's our basic understanding of, of PDI. And I don't think it's worth granulating too much finer than that, but clearly as your PDI 
uh, grows from 0.2 to much larger numbers, that would indicate uh, that you have a great deal of different species present. And then uh, can we talk about what is a typical resolution for a DLS? So uh, defining resolution by our ability to, to separate unique populations, something really needs to be threefold larger to see unique peaks in a DLS analysis. So if something is 10 nanometers, something would have to be 30 nanometers in order to see a separate peak. But for things smaller than that, you certainly would see a narrow peak broadening which indicates that there are multiple species there. You just can't resolve them into separate peaks. Okay. Uh, and then can you talk about the impact of refractive index and viscosity when measuring uh, different sizes and different formulation conditions, um, sure. how that could impact DLS well, results? Yeah, so viscosity is a central element of the Stokes-Einstein equation. And the more viscous, so, uh, you need to know the absolutely need to know the viscosity of something in order to accurately measure its hydrodynamic diameter. For instance, if you have a glycerol solution, uh, which is quite viscous, and you indicate that it has the viscosity of water when you're doing your interpretation, you're going to think that you have very large particles there. If you alter that viscosity to represent the actual viscosity of the solution, then you'll get the correct hydrodynamic diameter. So if you want correct hydrodynamic diameters, you really know the viscosity. Refractive index is part of the way that scattered light is interpreted. Uh, things with different refractive indices scatter light differently. And that has to be included as part of your interpretation of the DLS data. Uh, it has uh, less of an impact than viscosity does on the overall interpretation of data. Okay. Uh, and then uh, what are some ways to improve the quality of DLS data? Well, um, there are some very simple things that a scientist can do if they want to improve their DLS data. I, I would say the first thing to do is if you're getting poor data, you might want to increase the concentration of your analyte. That will always help. Now, there are upper limits, but if you're dealing with a, a low concentration, you know, have a twofold, threefold, fourfold higher concentration, you'll probably get really good DLS data. In addition to that, having more acquisition certainly improves the quality of your DLS data. So, you know, our default is to do four acquisitions in five seconds a piece. If you raise that to 10 acquisitions, you'll improve the quality of your DLS data. In addition to that, in, increasing the acquisition time will have a, uh, an effect on the quality of the data, not as much as changing the number of acquisitions, but it will still improve the um, quality of the data. So three things, increase your concentration, increase your uh, number of acquisitions, and increase your acquisition time. And you should be able to improve your, the quality of your DLS data in a, in a as significantly enough way that you'll notice. All right, okay. Well, thanks for answering all of those questions, Keith. Uh, and thank you for a great presentation. Uh, if there's any other questions on the list, then we'll be sure to follow up with uh, you afterwards. Um, so I also wanted to thank everyone that joined us live today. If you have one of a deeper conversation with our team, uh, please do get in touch with us at info at unchainlabs.com or visit our website at www.unchainlabs.com. I would love to connect with you. Uh, thank you again for attending our virtual seminar, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.